From the beginning of our marriage, I've been tormented by my snide mother-in-law and father-in-law. To make matters worse, they've constantly berated me for not being able to have children. To add insult to injury, even my husband, who was supposed to support me, said to me, My sister-in-law is young and beautiful. And unlike you, she's had kids right away. I'm honestly jealous of my brother. Moreover, my mother-in-law accused me of being infertile because I was having an affair and claimed she had caught me on hidden camera as proof of my so-called infidelity. So I devised a plan and called a family gathering under the pretext of celebrating my nephew's birthday where I proposed we watch the evidence of my alleged affair that my mother-in-law was talking about. Upon viewing it, words like I knew it slipped out in despair from my sister-in-law, Ken, and my father-in-law. My name is Mia. I'm 34 years old. I work in the international business division of a mid-sized trading company. I live with my husband, Ken, who is the same age as me and works at a steel manufacturer, and my in-laws. We don't have any children yet. I met my husband at a dating event that a friend invited me to. By my fourth year on the job, I was finally getting the hang of it and starting to enjoy it, so I wasn't very interested in getting married. But I couldn't refuse my college friend, who insisted, you have to come. My main interest was solely focused on the special menus that each restaurant had prepared for the dating event. Literally a case of bread is better than the songs of birds. I felt somewhat detached from my friend who was actively mingling. It turned out that she had become close to a man who was there with Ken. Apparently, Ken wasn't too keen on the event either and had been reluctantly dragged along. Somehow, as bystanders, we ended up hanging out together. But since I intended it to be a one-time thing, I deliberately didn't exchange contact information with him. However, exactly one week after the dating event, on a Friday, I received a call from an unknown number on my phone. At first, I ignored it, but after work, I started receiving calls every 10 minutes. Who on earth is this? I was annoyed and about to block the number, but before I did that, I answered the phone to see who was making such a call. It turned out to be Ken, whom I met at the dating event. Oh, good. Is this Maya? While I was relieved to find out who it was, I'm sure I hadn't given my number to Ken at that time. When I questioned Ken, he casually replied, I got this number by begging a friend who was with me at the event. It seemed that my friend, who had hit it off with Ken's friend, decided to start dating him following the dating event. Meanwhile, Ken, having failed to get my contact information, heard about this from his friend and managed to get my number by pestering my friend. Although I was negatively surprised by my friend for casually sharing my number and by Ken for taking advantage of that, we somehow started dating and a year later, he proposed to me. It wasn't exactly a whirlwind romance, but I thought I could live a peaceful life with Ken, who had a somewhat gentle and endearing personality. There were no issues from my side regarding the marriage. My parents had been living separately since I entered college. They hadn't divorced because they saw no particular benefit in doing so at this point. Friends and acquaintances would ask if I wasn't sad, but having been practically estranged within my own family, I saw their separation as an inevitable outcome. I was financially supported by my parents during my college years, so I visited my parents' houses alternately during long vacations. However, since I started working, I have been using my busy work schedule as an excuse to solely report what's going on on social networking sites. When I informed my parents about my marriage, they said they would attend a ceremony if one was held. But when I told them it would just be a registration with no special ceremony, they later sent me a substantial sum of money as a wedding gift, which was more than enough for me. However, my in-laws, Sarah and Sean, seemed dissatisfied with my parents' handling of the marriage. 
to think they would settle their only daughter's marriage with money. How incredibly insensitive, they sneered. Indeed, it's quite concerning, they said with a bitter tone. But then my now husband, Ken, defended me, saying, money is certainly a sign of love. It's absurd for mom, who has never worked, to say such a thing. Dad should know better given how hard it is to earn money. I felt truly happy for choosing him. However, about four years into our marriage, things started to take a turn for the worse. The first sign was my promotion. I had worked diligently in my assigned department since joining the company and decided to take the promotion exam that year. When I passed, I was told, Mia, you mentioned in your interview that you wanted to work globally in the future, right? How about starting in the International Business Division to gain some experience? I was thrilled that my efforts were recognized, and I thought I would be able to share that joy with Ken. But when I told him, he became visibly upset and lashed out. Oh, okay, and what are you trying to say? That you've climbed the ladder, that you're some big shot now. Surprised by Ken's reaction, I wondered if I had said something to offend him and apologized. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. However, Ken retorted, See, you playing the victim like that just proves you're looking down on me. And angrily threw his beer can into the trash before slamming the door and leaving our apartment. He didn't return for a week. He wouldn't read my texts or answer my calls. I even called his office, but they said he was out, and I could only confirm that he was safe. I considered waiting for him outside his office, but I didn't want to embarrass him. So I decided to go to my in-law's house to discuss the situation with them. I knew I'd be blamed, but I had no other choice. Despite the sudden visit, I was surprised at how smoothly I was let in. But as soon as I stepped into the living room, I was frozen by Ken's tirade. What do you want now? You've come all this way to mock me some more. Is that it? Of course, I immediately said that wasn't my intention and that I would apologize if I had caused any misunderstanding. But Ken was as unreceptive as ever. What's worse, my in-laws joined in, blaming me. Just because you both work doesn't mean you get to act all snobby. Don't you know that's not how a wife should behave? This is exactly why we were against this marriage from such an insane family. Sarah started cursing me as loudly as Ken. From there, it was just an endless lecture about how I was to blame for hurting their son's ego. No matter what I said, finally they said, Ken doesn't want to return to the apartment you two lived in. If you don't want a divorce, then move out of that apartment and come live here with us. We'll teach you how to be a proper wife. In hindsight, I wonder why I didn't just agree to a divorce right then and there. But at that time, I still had feelings for Ken. And having grown up watching my parents live as a married couple in name only, I was perhaps making misguided reflections about not understanding what marriage was. Soon after, I did as my mother-in-law suggested, moved out of the apartment, and started living with my in-laws. My in-laws were extremely pleased with this, and I soon understood why. It turned out that Ken's older brother by three years, Evan, who had been living with them, left the house about three months before my promotion, saying he wanted to live alone because he had found a girlfriend. Sarah, who had adored Evan, who graduated from a more prestigious university than Ken, was shocked and deeply distressed by his sudden departure. But the problem wasn't just the emotional shock. Evan's departure also meant the loss of the financial contributions he had been making to the household, which was a major issue. My in-laws are vain and like to show off, often hosting gatherings with relatives, serving them expensive drinks and food. Evan's financial contributions had been their lifeline, as my father-in-law's earnings from his post-retirement job were insufficient to cover their lavish spending. They had convinced Ken, who had come home to vent, to move in with them, and that was the real story behind our living situation. 
can, for his part, seem to enjoy this sudden attention after always feeling inferior to his accomplished brother. When I realized this, it was as if scales fell from my eyes. But more trouble was to come. Soon after, Avon married his girlfriend, Kelly, who turned out to be quite a handful. Kelly was six years younger than Avon and two years younger than both Ken and myself. She appeared fragile and delicate, the kind that stirs the protective instincts in men. This was true for both Sean and Ken, who became visibly restless whenever Kelly visited and acted like her followers. Sarah, not amused by this, began to berate me, saying, Ken is smitten with his brother's wife because you lack charm. If you just give birth to a grandchild, my husband would settle down as a grandfather. She even went so far as to suggest I quit my job to focus on getting pregnant. However, due to my in-laws' extravagant spending, the household expenses were skyrocketing, and Ken's salary alone couldn't cover them. Even when I showed them a document from the household budgeting software that explained this, they dismissed it, saying, that's just because you're bad at managing money, always full of excuses. Then Kelly became pregnant. Sarah, who had disliked Kelly, suddenly became obsessed with her first grandchild. She doted on her grandson, Justin, immensely. This led her to eagerly welcome Kelly's visits, which she had previously avoided, and even say things like, oh, how wonderful it would be to live under the same roof as such a lovely grandchild. Ken then started to throw remarks at me, dripping with sarcasm. Exactly, Kelly is young and beautiful, and unlike you, she gave birth to a child right away. I'm really envious of my brother. Sean chimed in. That's right, maybe we should just kick out the daughter-in-law who can't bear children and have Evan's family move in with us instead, he said carelessly. By then, even I started thinking, indeed, since we don't have children, perhaps leaving Ken, and this house might be an option. Then, as at Von Q, Kelly became pregnant with her second child. Sarah's obsession with her grandchildren intensified, and her treatment of me became even harsher. Somehow, she came up with the absurd theory and said, the reason you can't have children must be because you're having an affair. You're just worried you won't know if the child is Ken's or your lover's. I was dumbfounded and chose to ignore her. But one evening, I noticed Sarah smirking at me. Confused, I asked what was going on, and she said, You were indeed having an affair, just as I suspected. To my questioning, Sean and Ken, she declared, I've got proof of her affair on a hidden camera. I hired a professional, so it's foolproof, and burst out laughing joyfully. Hearing this, Sean and Ken were momentarily shocked, but then influenced by Sarah's confidence. They said, if that's true, then it's grounds for divorce. Of course, at that point, I said, understood. Then I will take this opportunity at Justin's birthday celebration next week, which we had already planned to explain the situation to all the relatives gathered there. The birthday celebration for Justin, organized by extravagant and loving Sarah, turned out to be a lavish affair with a banquet hall in a hotel reserved just for us. The invited relatives seemed somewhat fed up with Sarah's boasting, but appeared to enjoy the food and drinks. As the party was winding down and I took the microphone to speak, everyone turned their attention to me, wondering what was happening. I began, I apologize for interrupting your conversations, but I have a brief announcement to make to all of you gathered here today. The crowd murmured in confusion while my in-laws and Ken, assuming I was about to admit my guilt and discuss divorce, smirked just as they had before. The guests of honor today, the family of Evan, were also present. Upon my signal to the staff, a screen was lowered behind me as the projector was brought in and the lights dimmed. Everyone's attention turned to the screen as the video began to play. The video started with footage of a suspicious-looking hotel district, and as one particular hotel entrance came into focus, 
Ken, Sean, and Kelly's faces began to pale as expected. However, Sarah, unaware of what was about to unfold, looked around curiously, oblivious to the tension among the three. The next moment, a clear shot captured by the camera elicited a collective gasp of surprise from the relatives, and for good reason. The screen unmistakably showed Kelly and Sean hugging as they emerged from the hotel. The room fell silent as the video continued to show them sharing lingering, passionate hugs. As the two caught a taxi, the scene shifted, and the same hotel entrance was shown again in close-up. But this time, it wasn't Sean who emerged holding hands with Kelly, it was Ken. Ken, Sean, and Kelly all remained frozen, murmuring, I knew it. The room erupted into murmurs once again. At that moment, I paused the playback, turned the lights back on, and began to speak into the microphone. My announcement to all of you is exactly as you've just seen. My husband, Ken, and father-in-law, Sean, have been having affairs with Kelly, the wife of Evan. The evidence has been meticulously recorded by the investigation company hired by Sarah. I stated, showing a thick file of documents, which prompted more roars from the crowd. As the roars subsided, I revealed that the investigation company had been hired by Sarah not to uncover the infidelity of Sean, Ken, and Kelly, but to find evidence of my supposed affair in order to expel me. Probably Ken, who must have been annoyed by my presence, filled her with all sorts of nonsense. It's absurd to take such things seriously, I said, causing the relatives to look at Ken and Sarah with disbelief. Sarah declared victory without even checking the contents when the investigation company reported they had caught the evidence on camera. Unfortunately, I have no idea about such allegations. I then projected a photograph onto the screen. It was a snapshot taken at the maternity hospital when Justin was born, showing my sister-in-law holding Justin in the center with Avon smiling beside her and Ken and me, who had come to celebrate in the background. Since Sarah has always disliked me, I believe she didn't have a single clear photo of me. So she sent this snapshot to the investigation company, requesting them to find evidence of the daughter-in-law's infidelity, I explained. As I spoke, I glanced briefly at Sarah, who seemed taken aback as if I had hit the nail on the head. However, the investigation company commissioned for the task Mr. Kelly, who was holding the child, as the daughter-in-law under investigation. Upon starting their investigation, they unexpectedly captured Sean and Ken repeatedly visiting the hotel with Kelly. Believing Evan to be the husband under scrutiny, the investigators reported to Sarah that they had caught the evidence on camera. Sarah mistakenly believed this to be evidence of my alleged affair. When suddenly confronted with the existence of such evidence, I was initially surprised, but then something clicked in my mind. It was the name of the investigation company which appeared on the statement of the credit card used by Sarah. In fact, Sarah, who is a spendthrift, made me get a family card for her to use for her own purchases, etc., just in case the credit card in her name was not enough to cover the available credit card funds. Troubled by her making large purchases without consulting me, I had set up the card statement to be viewable in an app so I could preemptively check the monthly charges. So I took a half day off the next day and went to the investigation company to explain the situation. I then commissioned a new investigation myself. The investigation company, realizing their mistake, eagerly accepted the task to make amends. They quickly provided the results, hence the evidence presented today. As the screen was removed and the lights brightened, Kelly, Sean, and Ken all had pale faces. I approached the great aunt and uncle, whom my in-laws greatly respected, and requested, I apologize for the inconvenience, but I prefer not to expose the children, especially Justin, to the following discussion. Could someone please take them to another room? The great aunt and uncle immediately approached Kelly, 
took Justin and handed him over to their own children. The other children were also led to another room by several women, leaving behind furious relatives, a dazed Sarah and a bewildered Evan. Only Kelly, Sean, and Ken remained, shrieking under the stern glares of the relatives. Then Sarah, previously trembling, leaped towards Kelly, shouting, What have you done, betraying me and even with Sean and Ken? She lunged at Kelly. Several relatives rushed to stop her, but Kelly was already petrified. Sean and Ken were similarly frightened. However, I decided to deliver the final blow to them. Regrettably, given the circumstances, I will be divorcing Ken. I apologize for any inconvenience caused to everyone here. According to the investigation company, the improper relations between these three have been ongoing and not just recent. Reconciliation is impossible, I announced. Then pretending to stumble, I added, after reviewing the investigation results, I've been tormented by the thought that Justin and even the child Kelly is currently carrying might belong to Sean or Ken. Then the remaining women in the venue rushed over, rubbed my back, and took my arms to support me. They said to the three of them, What shameless people you are. You are all disgusting. Poor you, they started cursing. The men looked on with disdain, surrounding the three with cold stares. Silenced by the disapproval, Sean and Ken could do nothing but stand there as the only sounds in the room were Sarah's ranting and Kelly's sobbing. The aftermath of me dropping the bomb that day spread far and wide. When Evan found out that his wife had been cheating on him with his brother and father, he was dazed for a while. But as he regained his senses, he began to seriously suspect the second doubt I had raised, that of cuckoldry. Cuckoldry? That's just a blatant lie from her. Both Justin and the baby in my womb are undeniably your children, Kelly pleaded desperately. But a suspicion once planted in the heart does not disappear with just a few words. Stealing a moment when Kelly was off guard, Evan used a paternity test kit he had ordered to check their father-child relationship, and the results turned out to be positive. However, even when confronted with the results, Kelly adamantly refused to admit to cuckoldry, frustrating Evan to the point where he contacted her parents. Caught completely off guard, Kelly's parents couldn't accept the story from Evan alone and came to my office to demand an explanation about the whole affair. Though I found it bothersome, I thought this was what I had to do eventually. So I took the next day off and went with Kelly's parents and the couple to the law firm I had hired. When the lawyer, Tom, showed them the related documents and the infamous video, Kelly's parents were speechless. Seeing this, even triumphantly declared, See, I told you she betrayed me, cheating with both my brother and father. It's clear neither Justin nor the baby she's carrying are mine. However, Tom cut him off sharply. Would you mind discussing that among yourselves? You're here not to discuss who the father of the children is, but to demand the child support. Of course, it was obvious I couldn't comprehend why Tom, whom I had hired, should take Evan's side. But what shocked me more were Kelly and her parents. After all, it's your fault. Ken cheated on you because you were working all the time not being attractive, right? Then it's your own doing, Kelly retorted mockingly. But I replied, is that so? Then we'll have to let a third party decide who's right, perhaps a judge. The ones who turned pale at that moment were Kelly's parents, and no wonder since both of them were teachers at a prestigious girls' school in the local area. The idea of their daughter, who was supposed to embody the ideals of a good wife and wise mother, Having a sordid affair in cuckoldry with her brother-in-law and father-in-law would definitely tarnish their reputation. Upon hearing the word trial, Kelly's parents immediately begged, We sincerely apologize. However, as far as I was concerned, an apology at this stage from anyone was irrelevant. I gave Tom a look and got up, signaling the end of the meeting. 
Later, Tom informed me that after I left, Evan, Kelly, and her parents caused a huge uproar, but finally left after Tom threatened to call the police. Subsequently, perhaps as a form of hush money, Kelly's parents transferred a large sum of money through Tom. Given this turn of events, what happened to Avon and Kelly was of no consequence to me. But around the same time, I learned about the fate of my in-laws through Ken, who had also demanded asset division. According to Ken, Evan filed for divorce. Furthermore, he refused to pay child support for Justin, and also for the unborn child unless a DNA test proved he was the father. He declared he would file for denial of paternity as soon as the child was born. Fearing the worst, Kelly's parents, against her wishes, forced her to undergo prenatal testing. It turns out the father of the unborn child was indeed not even, but astonishingly Ken. Furthermore, the revelation that Justin's father was Sean made the situation beyond redemption. Upon learning this, Sarah, who had doted on Justin, was devastated to find out he was actually her husband's child, leading to a mental breakdown. She has aged rapidly and is now almost bedridden, with Sean taking care of her around the clock. He told his father-in-law, I won't look after you in your old age. Get Ken to take care of you. Unfortunately, most of Sean's retirement funds were spent on luxury brands and jewelry for Kelly to win her favor leaving almost nothing behind. As a result, the offset against the inheritance meant Sean and Sarah, now abandoned by Evan, turned to Ken in desperation. Ken, himself already burdened with the asset division claims from me, was reportedly being pressured by Kelly, who had been divorced by Evan, with a demand to remarry her. Insisting now that it's come to this, you're going to take responsibility for both the unborn child and me, she said. I'm sorry for everything that's happened. I apologize, so please give me another chance. I love you, Mia, he begged for forgiveness. But it was clear that what he wanted back was not my love, but my financial support, and a wife to take care of his parents for free. Since I had no lingering feelings for Ken, I instructed Tom to convey my final decision and blocked all contact except for one social media platform. Eventually, the divorce was finalized. Despite some disputes, the asset division was paid in full in two installments. According to Tom, Kelly continued to live with my in-laws without being officially registered as part of the family, pretending to be Ken's wife. However, after the visiting relatives spread the word, the entire neighborhood began whispering about that shameless family, driving her to become a recluse at home. She neither helped with caring for Sarah nor took care of Justin and the newborn, leading to a report to child services by the kindergarten concerned about Justin's unkempt appearance. In the end, Kelly's parents took in the two children but disowned her, saying, you are no longer our daughter, nor are we your parents. Never show your face to us again. With nowhere else to turn, Kelly came to rely on Ken for everything, just like my parents-in-law. Ken's income alone now supports four adults, including his mother who needs nursing care. Moreover, according to a colleague of Ken's who works at the same company, a relative who works at an affiliated company has exaggerated the story, making Ken the target of rumors, as bad as the scumbag of the compilation video site. Despite the difficult circumstances, he continues to work, unable to quit due to financial needs, and is enduring the discomfort. For some reason, Evan seemed to regard us as fellow victims, Yet the fact remains that he looked down on me along with Kelly and in-laws as a woman unable to bear children. Naturally, I ignored him completely at work, but as rumors somehow spread within our company, he couldn't bear the whispers and volunteered to transfer to a subsidiary in a regional area. After everything was settled on my end, I was approached about a transfer to an overseas branch. Though I had expressed a desire to work abroad during my job interview, 
the sudden offer honestly caught me off guard. However, my bosses encouraged me, acknowledging the career I had diligently built and the language skills I continued to learn in my spare time. Feeling fed up with the rumors, much like Avon, albeit for different reasons, I decided to take a bold step and accept the assignment. Ken, who somehow heard the news, sent a series of Kleich romantic messages pleading for reconciliation to the only social media account I hadn't blocked him on. But planning to cancel my phone service when I leave the States, I decided to ignore them. Despite all that happened, cutting ties with that in-law family felt like a stroke of luck. With this in mind, I feel ready to face any challenges that may come my way. I might think it's a bit opportunistic, but that's honestly how I feel. Perhaps I had been too self-deprecating all this time. From now on, I plan to stay positive and give everything my best effort.